I remember one night when I was about 13, my sister's friend dressed my face up with all kinds of makeup. Once her masterpiece was complete, she turned to my sister and said, wow, Ashley, your sister would be so pretty if she wore makeup. She didn't have to tell me twice. I followed the solid advice given to me from a 14-year-old girl and quickly adopted the ritual of applying makeup each morning before school. I went to a private Catholic school from first to eighth grade, so I had been what you might call sheltered till about the age of 14. My first week in public school was what I imagine the transition is like for a baby monkey to be fostered in a safe and structured zoo environment and later dropped off in the jungle where young monkeys talk back to elder monkeys and unexpectedly break out in fistfights because they didn't like the way another monkey was eyeing their banana. My sister, 11 months my elder and a grade above me, had attended Catholic school with me, but she adapted to public school life pretty quickly her freshman year. She instantly became one of the popular pretty girls, and in effect, she became my fashion consultant. She would guide me in choosing which clothes were acceptable to wear to school, and she strongly encouraged me to start wearing mascara and eyeliner to make my green eyes pop. Once I entered public school, my shy and innocent Catholic school nature was pretty immediately corrupted by an exclusive clique that popular culture would come to refer to as mean girls. I rode on the same bus as one of the head mean girls, and she somehow knew my name and which boys I knew from my Catholic school community, boys she wanted to know. With seemingly no hesitation, she befriended me. I didn't know one single person in the jungle called Buna High School, and I was eager to make friends, so I agreed to hang out with her and the other mean girls she introduced me to. Soon enough, I was frequently participating in the common practice of talking shit on whichever mean girl was not present for the bashing. Little comments like, Melanie totally pulls her thong up above her pants so boys can see it. She's such a slut was an inference expressed quite frequently amongst these girls, and ultimately me. But I made the naive mistake of not considering that when something like my 10 o'clock curfew was being enforced, the mean girls were hanging out without me, and I was the mean girl being bashed. Talking about someone to a mutual friend, instead of confronting them to their face, became such a bad habit that even in my adult life, I have to constantly remind myself not to do it. By sophomore year, Jackie became my best mean girl friend, and also the obsessive love interest of an 11th grade boy who had in return become a pretty close friend of mine. She took pride in leading Anthony on, but would make fun of him to me and would muse at the fact that she had no interest in ever actually dating him. Anthony started getting frustrated with Jackie's games and he'd often confide in me via AOL Instant Messenger how she was breaking his little 17-year-old heart. Finally, he decided to completely throw in the towel, and he asked me if I would go to prom with him. I considered the effect it could have on Jackie, but I decided that Jackie had repeatedly affirmed she had no romantic feelings for Anthony, so going to the prom as his friend would not be a friend violation. And since a few of my friends had been asked to go to the junior-senior prom, it was very important to me that I, too, would be a sophomore attending the exclusive event wearing an overpriced dress I would never wear again. I honestly can't remember if I told Jackie that Anthony asked me to go to prom or if she heard it from another mean girl, but to say the least, she was informed. Jackie concealed the overflowing resentment she developed for me and I hadn't thought too much of Anthony's short responses over Instant Messenger later that week, at least not until I was sitting in chemistry class, and one of my mean girl friends said, there's something I really want to tell you, but I can't. <laughs> I replied, um, please tell me. I just can't. But I will say this. You should be really pissed at Jackie. It didn't take an excessive amount of pleading to get her to disclose what she apparently had sworn to secrecy, but you can't expect much from a mean girl. Okay, so 
So Jackie got really mad that you agreed to go to prom with Anthony. And she told him that you were just using him to go to prom and that you wouldn't even talk to him as soon as you got there. I stared at her, trying to make sense of what she was telling me. Jackie convinced Anthony to let you think he was taking you to prom, but to never actually pick you up and just leave you sitting there waiting. She said this with a hidden smile only another mean girl could recognize. <laughs> My heart felt like it was going to jump right out of the chemistry classroom window. It didn't make sense. Jackie was acting totally fine to me the whole week. And she didn't even like Anthony. For God's sakes, we had a bash book we would exchange between classes that she drew insulting and cruel pictures of him in, emphasizing details on what she called his broccoli hair. I'd, <laughs> I'd become a victim of my own device. I thanked my fellow mean girl for telling me the news and paced to my locker. Another friend walked up to me and exclaimed, I can't believe what Jackie did to you. <laughs> Words certainly traveled fast in my 800 kid school. We all heard about what she did. She totally beat her up for that. <laughs> I was definitely filled with rage, but a physical confrontation had not occurred to me. After all, I'd been conditioned to express my feelings of anger and resentment in secret, not to actually communicate them to the person who caused them. I began walking to the stairwell to head downstairs to the cafeteria. I noticed a lot of people walking in the same direction as me, even though the bell had rang and anyone who wasn't scheduled for lunch would be expected to be in class. One of my sister's friends came up to me and placed one of her rings on my finger. Here, you'll need this. I'll need this for what? I asked. To fight Jackie, she said. <laughs> I'm not gonna fight Jackie, I nervously said as I removed the ring from my finger. Once I entered the cafeteria, my already rapid heartbeat accelerated. It was like an Eminem concert, a large room filled with adolescents that didn't belong there. <laughs> I saw Josh, the handsome senior quarterback of our high school football team. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm here to see you fight Jackie, he nonchalantly replied. <laughs> this is when I felt myself begin to detach from my body. I'd seen many D.A.R.E. commercials warning kids about peer pressure to take drugs, but they never mentioned anything about the peer pressure you could face when like a 90s teen drama, your best friend convinces your prom date to stand you up and everyone in your high school pressures you to beat that bitch up. <laughs> the peer pressure was suffocating. I walked toward Jackie, sitting at our lunch table, her back facing me. Thoughts of her devastating betrayal rapidly flashed through my mind like a slideshow on repeat. Unbeknownst to her, the cafeteria was crawling with about a hundred kids not waiting to be served food, but instead hungrily waiting for a physical altercation between the two of us. I felt my mind go blank as adrenaline rushed through my entire body like a bullet. Carly, what are you doing? She screamed as my hand grabbed her hair and pulled it away from her head. Still very detached from my conscious self, and instead the now wild monkey finally realizing the extent of its freedom, I responded by attempting to punch her in the head. <laughs> she quickly caught on to the fact that we were engaged in a fist fight, and she tried to hit me back. It was like one of those weird dreams where you're struggling to throw punches in self-defense, but you find there's absolutely no force behind your movements. All of a sudden, my beloved English teacher grabbed me and put me in a headlock. And out of nowhere, my sister jumped on Jackie's back. <laughs> the epic fight lasted approximately 10 seconds. <laughs> I was sent directly to the vice principal's office where I was asked to disclose elaborate details about my personal life to this woman I had never met before and explain to her what influenced me to strike another student. 
There was a new pol- uh, new tolerance policy at our high school, which meant that whoever started a fight was always considered at fault. But unlike most teen drama, this was not so cut and dry. The vice principal's response echoes in my head to this day. Look, you're a pretty girl, and girls are going to be jealous of you. There's always going to be someone you piss off. You just got to figure out how to make good choices with what you have. (laughs) Most of the conversation that day has become blurred in my memory, but the part about making people jealous is what resounds in my head. Even though I had, in fact, gotten tangled up in being a mean girl, I never actually thought of myself as a pretty girl, and I definitely hadn't considered that what Jackie had conspired to do to me was an effect of her being jealous of me. I never really thought of anyone being jealous of me, much less that it would cause me emotional pain and downright heartbreak. We were 15. Things weren't supposed to be that painful and complicated. I wanted to return to the Catholic school zoo I had been raised in. Confused and exhausted, I left the vice principal's office with a tear in my favorite shirt and a three-day in-school suspension. Although I initiated the fight, Jackie also ended up with a three-day in-school suspension due to the nature of the fight. And my loyal accomplice sister was also graced with the same sentencing. Ironically, Jackie was forced to write me an apology letter which ended up being a pretty genuine and heartfelt letter that helped us mend our wounded friendship. She wrote about how we were best friends and we shouldn't let jealousy, other girls, and especially not boys, influence us to hurt each other. She promised to let me know from then on when I did something that upset her and she requested I do the same. I can't say Jackie has stayed true to her promise in our oscillating friendship, but nonetheless, it propelled our friendship forward at the time. Things didn't seem too altered after that, aside from childish mishaps, like when she playfully jumped on my back during gym class, I immediately fell to the ground, and that resulted to everyone else in our gym class describing to others as Jackie's malicious attempt at round two. (laughs) I ended up being asked to go to prom with another 11th grade boy, but looking back now, I don't think I even danced with him. Instead, I spent a lot of time dancing and talking to another 11th grade boy I met. I'm ashamed to say, it wouldn't be the last time I let someone down for my own selfish reasons. And in a way, I guess Jackie knew me better than I knew myself. Fighting Jackie was certainly not my finest hour, but the whole incident has proven to be a large piece of the puzzle that makes up who I am today. It would take me years to realize I was never really the victim in the story. I was just another player in the superficial and competitive games that females so quickly agree to participate in. Since high school, I've attended the engagement parties of my mean girlfriends, gone to their weddings, held their babies. But I've found that time has a very subtle way of revealing to us which people we truly connect with and what it means to be a friend and to have a friend. When I was 15, I thought being a friend meant staying up all night, singing Avril Lavigne and making embarrassing music videos together. But if it means being able to trust each other and genuinely sharing in each other's happiness, then I have to wonder, were any of us ever really friends? Carly Critchmar.